Next, we want to take a look at the efficiency of the simplex method. We have a brief look at one pivot step, uh, but most of the video will be focused on so-called pivot rules and then the overall efficiency of the simplex method. For watching this video, you should know what the simplex method is. If not, make sure to watch the previous videos. As a warm-up, you might want to uh, apply the simplex method to this linear program. But if you're confident with the simplex method, you can also skip this part. Let me at least briefly discuss this, at least up to the point where we decide on which non-basic variable to make basic. That decision, that's called a pivot rule. So what you would do here is the following. First of all, we bring the LP into equational form, which means we add select variables. For instance, the first inequality would then be an equality by adding x4 as a select variable here. We also require that x4 is at least zero, and we will do that for all of the constraints then with x5 and x6. Then our initial basis, we can take the select variable, so x4, x5, x6 as our initial basis because b is non-negative. Then we would write down our simplex tableau. So the simplex tableau will have the basic variable, so x4, x5, x6 here, and then we'll write them in terms of the non-basic variables, and then we'll have z here also in terms of the non-basic variables. Um, in particular, this is already written there, 9x1 plus 3x2 plus x3. Then we need to decide on a variable, a non-basic variable to swap in. It has to be one with a positive coefficient. If there are several choices, we can pick one. And that, this choice is called a pivot. So one natural choice would be to say we take the one with the largest coefficient because there we make the most gain per unit of that variable. But you might think about whether you think that's a good rule or not. So a good alternative would be, for instance, to try all three and then decide on, based on which one makes the most progress in terms of the objective function. That's more expensive, but it might be better. Okay, we'll discuss pivot rules uh, a bit later on. And then after deciding that, then we'll see which basic variable leaves, so becomes non-basic. If there are several options, then that again is part of a pivot rule. And then we get a new tableau and continue. Okay, so let's start talking about efficiency. And for that, I would first want to take a look at one step of the algorithm. So going from one tableau to the next one, so-called pivot step. In terms of computer implementation, you would not actually compute the full tableaus, but you would actually want to maintain just these quantities. So B, um, A, B inverse, and then A, B inverse, B, which is, is uh, P. So let me remind you, that we had, so as this is from the previous video, xb, so the basis, so now I'm just writing down the simplex tableau as p plus q times xn, and then we also have z, which is um, z0 plus r transposed times xn. So we're writing xb, so the, the basic variables in terms of the non-basic variables and also the objective function in terms of the non-basic variables. And this, this P we maintain and we maintain the inverse of AB. So AB was the A restricted to the columns or, uh, of B. And for instance, Q, then we could calculate as such. We will not do that explicitly because that's too expensive. But we can get all of the information that we need out of those quantities. Now, this is what we would man maintain, just that we wouldn't actually want to in take the inverse because that's numerically an instable, but instead we maintain the so-called LU factorization of AB. So this is not important for the remainder of the video, but let me just briefly mention so you can write what does a LU factorization mean. So we can write the matrix AB so AB is a non-singular matrix, so we can write it in this um, LU form, where L means stands for lower, so mean, meaning that above the diagonal I have a zero, uh, times and then upper, where then below the um, diagonal I have a zero. So we can write AB like that, and this 
allows us to do the computations that we want to do. And we can maintain all of this information in m squared or m squared time instead of o of m times n, what we would need for the whole tableau. Short remarks, this doesn't mean that I can do one step in this time o of m squared because I still need uh, to find the non-basic variable to swap in and depending on how I do that. So if I would have to check all of them, then I would again get the m times n. So let's take one step as simply a unit. Then we have to, the question is how many such steps do we do? And for that, let's first take a look at pivot rules. So we have a simplex tableau here and we need to decide which variable, non-basic variable, x1 or x2, to swap into the basis. Yeah, so how, which one would you choose here? So a natural choice that we saw in the previous LP would be to take the one with the largest coefficient. Now both here have the same coefficient, but that is a reasonable rule to say we take the one with the largest coefficients, that's so-called Danzig's rule, um, which means we are maximizing the improvement per unit of, of whatever we're swapping in. But this does not necessarily lead to the largest increase in Z. So that is a different rule. We simply try all options and see which one in one step, so in one pivot step, increases the Z, or so our objective value the most. Another popular rule is the steepest edge. So intuitively, what we're doing here is we're asking ourselves, I look at the direction of change in terms of my solution, which one is most in the direction of the objective function. So what I have here is I have my x new minus x old. So this is, if this is my x old, this is if I go up, it's here, or if it go to the right, it's here. Uh, but I look at a unit of that. So instead of this long vector, I have this shorter vector here. Uh, and then I multiply that with my objective, which tells me how much I'm going into the direction of the objective with one unit of my change in terms of x. And in terms of practical pivot rules, this is a great choice. Then other rules, Blanche rule, this simply takes the one with the smallest index. Also, if I have several choices of swapping basic variables out, I'm also taking the one with the smallest index, and this will prevent cycling. Otherwise, it's rather slow compared to the other methods, but it does guarantee that we avoid cycling. So in terms of theory, it's a good rule to have. And another option is simply taking a random edge from where I am. This allows us to prove interesting theoretical guarantees in terms of the expected efficiency. Now, if we chose our pivot rule, we have everything for the algorithm in place. So now we can ask ourselves how many pivot steps does the simplex method need? Bad news is for any of the standard choices for pivot rules, we actually get exponential running time. And here is an example. So first on an intuitive level, what could happen? So imagine you have a perturbed cube. So perturbed in or transformed cube in a sense like, so let's do the 2D. Let's say I start at this vertex. This is the optimal one. And somehow I'm forced to go through all of the vertices of this cube. Then we know that a cube has two to the n vertices. So I have two to the n minus one steps. In 3D, this might look like that. So I'm down here. And for some reason, I first go through the lower four vertices. Only then I go up and go through the remaining ones. Yeah, and then if you generalize this, this would end up with two to the n minus one. This can actually happen. So the cube that you see here comes from the following program. And that is the one that we saw initially. So here you see the same LP. So if you look at the coefficients, that's exactly what we had on the slide. So I'm using this package GILP 
for visualization and I can also tell the simplex method which pivot rule to use. So I'm using Dancex rule here with the largest coefficient. So let's run this. And you now see here exactly the polytope that we already had. And we start at the corner down there. And if you look at the iterations of the simplex method, it wraps around, then only goes up. And only after seven iterations ends up at the optimal corner. For the other rules, for this specific example, I might directly jump to the right corner. But generally speaking, so also for the other rules, we can construct polytopes. So we can construct LPs, which then geometrically correspond to polytopes, where I will have to go through an exponential number of the corners. What we would like to have, but what hasn't been achieved so far, is we would like to have a pivot rule for which we can prove that the number of pivot steps is actually polynomial in N and M, number of variables, number of constraints. But so far, all of the pivot rules we can actually prove exponential. There are some positive results which I want to uh, briefly discuss. So if we randomly order all variables and then we use Bland's rule, then the expected number of pivot steps is actually bounded by this number here e to the and then we have the square root of n log n so if it would be simply exponential then instead of square root of n log n we would have a n so that is much better than 2 to the n but still much worse than polynomial so now you could say okay if you want to have something worst case with which is better than the others let's take this one here but keep in mind that in most cases, the simplex method is much faster anyway. So this is not a reason why you would want to use Bland's rule. That's just a theoretical result. Another result, assume we would know the best choice of which variable to swap out or in, in a polytope, uh, the next vertex to jump to. Then, I mean, that would mean that we essentially walk along a shortest path on the polytope boundary. So for that rule, if you want to call it a rule, it is known that at most n to the one plus log n steps are needed. So this is still not polynomial as an upper bound, but it's quite close to that and it's much better than anything exponential. For a long time, it was conjectured that this rule actually gives us something linear. So this is called Hirsch's conjecture, but that was disproven. It's still open whether if we could guess the right corner to jump to, whether we would then be done in a polynomial number of steps. So that's a big open problem. So let's add some more positive results by adding randomness. So if we have a suitably defined uh, concept of random linear programs. Then one can prove that uh, with high probability you only need m squared pivot steps. Another positive result, uh, and this is called smoothed analysis, or this general concept in algorithm analysis is smoothed analysis. So if we have an arbitrary linear program, but we uh, suitably add random noise to the coefficients, then Again, this only requires a polynomial number of pivot steps with high probability, and the bound here obviously depends on how much noise you add. This already concludes this video. Since it's the last video in the series on the simplex method, I would like to conclude with a summary of the simplex method as such. So we have a linear program that we want to solve. And first of all, we have to make sure that it's in equational form. If not, we first convert it into one in equational form. Then if there's an obvious basic feasible solution, which we often have based on the slack variables, then we can simply take that. If not, we will have to solve in the auxiliary LP. This then either gives us a basic feasible solution or if not, we know that our original LP was infeasible. For that basic feasible solution, we then compute the simplex tableau. 
Then we look at the objective function in terms of the non-basic variables. And if none of them has a positive coefficient, then we know there's no point in swapping them into the basis. And we even know that we already have an optimal solution. If there is one with a positive coefficient for the objective function, then we swap one of the with positive coefficient into the basis. And which one? That depends on our pivot rule. Then we have to see which of the constraints that you, we previously had constrains our new basic variable most. If none of them constrains it, then our program is unbounded. So again, we're done. Otherwise, we take the one that constrains it most. If there are several of those, again, we will need a pivot rule to decide which one to take out. We now have a new basis. We can have our new tableau. So we again start at step four and find a new non-basic variable to swap in and so on. And that's all that I wanted to say about the simplex method.